Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Tonight, we're going to be continuing our quest into the extragalactic domain. We've talked about the types of galaxies, how they're distributed in space. But if we go out even further and just think about what is out there, that there's happening way out there in the cosmos, we find that some of the most violent things in the universe are happening really close next door, considering, uh, considering cosmological distances. So we're going to talk about active galaxies and quasars, some of the most luminous objects in the universe and how we know that and what, are, what the strange observations we have of them are. Active galaxies were discovered first in 1943 by Carl Seifert. He identified six kinds of galaxies. And well, actually, they were, uh, well, he studied them most exactly. He, he studied uh, galaxies that had strong broad emission lines. And they came from the center of the galaxy, meaning mostly, uh, coming mostly from the center, meaning we cut the nucleus of the galaxy, and they were bright and compact galaxies. Those are called Seifert galaxies because, you know, the guy who discovered them were Seifert. Well, in the 50s, uh, radio telescopes found that some of the faint galaxies that were, were, there were many, many, many faint galaxies found at the location of extraordinary radio emission, and they're called radio galaxies. Okay, so kind of had names for things before we really knew what they were, but so there were Seifert galaxies with broad emission lines and radio galaxies doing a lot of extra radio emission. Um, but the thing is, is that when you look at it with optical spectroscopy, we see that there's broad emission lines in their spectrum. What he did uh, back in actually, uh, why did like, why did uh, Carl Seifert actually go and look at these things? Well, back in uh, back in the day, prior to the 1920s and 1930s, Vesta Slipher and Edwin Hubble looked at a specific one, one of the nearby galaxies, NGC 1068, which is one of the Messier objects. I believe it's Messier 60, uh, 77. Um, found it to have a really weird spectrum. And that's an odd thing. And what they did is that Seifert did do the follow up. And this was one of his first galaxies that he looked at. And he found that it had big emission lines of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. And this is a more modern version of its spectrum taken by Mostakis and Kennecott back in 2006. And we find, if you look closely, that there are some really, really bright hydrogen emission lines, specifically the one at 6,550 angstroms. That is hydrogen. We also see the helium line at 5,000. And there's also some other bright oxygen lines floating around in there, too. But notice it just kind of has a flat spectrum uh, from left to right, unlike the star spectra that we saw. So this is a very different sort of spectrum. And notice the hydrogen emission is extraordinarily wide. That wouldn't look pink. That would look, that would look kind of reddish, but it wouldn't have that distinct pink that we associate with those star forming regions like we see in the spiral arms of this particular galaxy. Look at that little inset image, and you see that there's these pink glows. Those are star-forming regions, and that's the pink stuff. Now, that is also at the, at the wavelength of 6563, but notice the intensity of the light at that one specific wavelength. Also then, compare it with the bright kind of yellowish-whitish center of the nucleus. The nucleus that we see in the inset is the place where this spectrum comes from. If we were to look at just the pink uh, clouds off to the right hand of the, of the center, we would only see a bright pink thing. So that uh, at that specific wavelength, and we wouldn't see much else. That's why it looks that pinkish color. But the bright center of the galaxy has uh, is enormous hydrogen emission, which is very broad, as well as emission at other wavelengths too. But that's right down in the center. So it doesn't look pink though, which is really interesting. That's because it's bright at many wavelengths. So if we then zoom in and look at just that central region, just that tiny, tiny dot in the center, not the outskirts, but the really bright center of the, of the image of that galaxy, we find and focus in specifically on the wavelength band only for hydrogen emission. You, you can then see just how broad the emission line is. It's not just at 6563 six, angstroms. It's really smeared out and much, much wider. So it's uh, almost 100 angstroms wide and more like 50 or 60 angstroms wide when an emission nebula like the Orion Nebula or something like that will only be about 5 or 10 angstroms wide. This, is, this broadening is due to what we call Doppler broadening. And Doppler broadening means that there's some clouds of gas that are moving towards us and some clouds of gas that are moving away from us. And some of them are moving extraordinarily fast, up to 5 or 10, 5,000 kilometers per second. So how does that make it broad? 
Well, as you can see in the inset, we've got some cloud. We got, now we can break it down to individual particles inside the cloud. And we see that if, if well, if bulk clouds, but let's just pretend we're looking at each of these dots as one individual cloud. So if, they're, if it's really moving fast, then the hydrogen, and if it's moving fast towards us, the hydrogen can blue sh can absorb light that would or emit light. This is all an emission now. The emission from a from a hydrogen atom moving very quickly towards us, its wavelength of light would be blue shifted, and hydrogen moving very quickly away from us will be strongly red shifted. Now it's a mix between a lot of uh, between uh, between high redshift and low redshift, but mostly in between. So that's what the color combination is trying to show in the image. So the average is going to be kind of right on the center of it because the average is definitely on the center, but there's some high moving parts and some low moving parts. However, when we're looking at the central region of this galaxy, it's not really that. It's whole huge clouds such as the pink dots, but they're really, really, really tight in and they're really compact. And so they're moving extraordinarily fast and they're extraordinarily bright. So let's see some other observations of them, some other Seifert type galaxies, which are really pretty. So in the center of this image, we see NGC 4151, which is about uh, 62 million light years away. Uh, this picture was taken by Adam Block with the Mount Lemmon Sky Center at University of Arizona. Uh, and it was taken on a 32 inch scope of the Schulman Foundation Telescope. In fact, this was another one of the core group that, that Seifert additionally used to define the term a Seifert galaxy. Now, we are going to say this a couple of times, that the, the nucleus might hold a black hole. I'm going to allude to that in the next lecture, but let's actually step away from that, step back from that idea, and actually just look at the nature of what, what we're actually seeing. That's actually funny is, is that there might be binaries that they orbit really fast, but the most important thing in this is that we've got a very, very, very bright, compact region of the galaxy that has very strong emission lines and looks kind of whitish, but it's bright overall. In fact, if you look really closely at this thing, you'd guess that the central region is easily just as bright as all the rest of the galaxy combined, and you'd be right. All right, another, uh, another wonderful Seifert galaxy is NGC 1097. It's an extraordinarily bright nucleus uh, and a bar-like structure. It's about 45 million uh, light years away. It's, it exhibits some of this, and this picture was taken by the European Southern Observatory's uh, VLT, VLT on a couple of nights. It just so happened that I believe the president of Spain was there during this observation down in Chile. This is another Seifert galaxy, NGC 7469. Uh, this, it's the one in the upper right. It's actually colliding with the one that's in the lower left. Uh, this is almost 200 million light years away. That's why it looks fuzzier than all the rest. It's farther away, so it's harder to get it clear. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image uh, and that you can go uh, check out that image with. But, the, but again, we see a very, very, very bright, compact nucleus. Let's compare and contrast a bit. So a, ga a galaxy's nucleus, a normal galaxy, is the exact center of a galaxy. It's pretty much the same no matter what. So you have the galaxy's nucleus is the center. If it's the spiral galaxy, then it's the exact center of rotation of the entire galaxy. And ellipticals, it's like this dynamical center around which everything seems to be orbiting. And, so, uh, and then for normal galaxies, there's always some sort of really dense star cluster in the center. Maybe there's a, a supermassive black hole, almost always actually. And the spectrum shows uh, of a normal galaxy, lots and lots and lots of stars and lots of absorption lines. And so there's a bunch of things happening in there. There might be, might be gas emission and so forth, but mostly it's stars and gas and dust. And it's a composition of those things. And so you can see that. And there might be some weak nebular emission lines, like the hydrogen emission lines. However, if you're looking at an active galactic nucleus, it's very different. Roughly about 10% of all galaxies have what we call our active galaxies or active nuclei. This is a really fuzzy number. You look around the inner, you look around at it, and this number is very fuzzy. But let's just it's the not the most important thing is not all galaxies are active. So the but in general, an active galaxy shows a bright, compact galaxy, and sometimes it's brighter than the entire rest of the galaxy. The spectrum is different too than a normal galaxy. There are those strong broad emission lines like I showed you before, and they're coming from extraordinarily hot, very excited gas that's moving really fast around. 
These AGN, or active galactic nuclei, they're also variable. So if you were to take a spectrum of them, or their brightness, they vary on extraordinarily t- short timescales, for about a day or so. That means that whatever's making this variation is very small, meaning it has to be smaller than one or two light days across in order for it to be coherent enough that we actually see it. Spiral galaxies tend to be the ones that we see with this kind of uh, Seifert level activity. And but the when we talk about like really dominant cores, it's only about 1% of them. So the truly dominant ones are, are kind of rare. An interesting one that is shown uh, that that I like to show, and it's kind of one of the quintessential ones that you'll see in textbooks and online, is the Circinus galaxy. It's a spiral that's really actually kind of close. It's only about 12 million light years away. It's one of the local neighborhood sort of galaxies. And, but it wasn't discovered because it's basically in the plane of the Milky Way until 1977. Um, so since you're in the middle of a star field and dust plane of the Milky Way, it can easily be mistaken for some. I think, in fact, you'll look in the literature and you'll find that it was mistaken for like a standard nebula. In any event, uh, then the, then there's a classic Hubble image of Seifert galaxies, the Seifert uh, Circinus galaxy taken with the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, and that's what I put in the inset there. And that inset was taken uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope by Wilson et al. at the uh, University of Maryland. And that was part of their study. What we see, though, is that another, an amb- uh, another astronomer, Judy Schmidt, took a bunch of the Hubble observations that were taken and then rejiggered them using Photoshop and so forth and focused in on the core and made what she considered more of a true color image. And it does look very true colorish. Uh, the rings, and you can see the rings of the hydrogen gas, and that's why it's pink. And so the rings, of, and then there's some ejected gas that's being shot out at high speed in the upper right. And this is actually not a very large region. There's two kind of ringish structures. One of them is about 1,400 light years across, and the very deep inner ring is only about 200 light years across, or 300 light years across. So really, this very close by galaxy that's exhibiting extraordinary uh, uh, active galaxies in its uh, active galactic nuclei is pretty close by. So we're seeing that there's some really violent things happening in this galaxy because pretty much for the Cicinus galaxy, it's all about the core and it's almost nothing about the rest of it. So I invite you to go kind of hunt that down and I'll post the uh, image, uh, the link online. So here's a, and then there's another set. So Seiferts were one kind of active galaxy. The other one I alluded to at the beginning were once discovered with radio telescopes. These are called radio galaxies. And so we, what we see is we've got a combination of a, of a NASA, NRAO, and a NSF image. What we have is we have a specific, the, the radio emission is in red, and it looks like that puffy, cloudy stuff. And then we have the wide field camera for the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and that was done by uh, Kiel et al. at the University of Alabama. But what we see is that the visual image of the wide of the advanced camera for surveys wide field camera, uh, which is the which is the kind of optical sort of view, and then we have the red puffy glow, and that is the radio emission from this galaxy. So we're starting to get a hint that radio emission is very different than the rest of the emission of the galaxy. And even on the right hand side of this image, we see some strong radio emission that looks like kind of a feathery sort of jutting sort of thing in the center that seems to be bright as a dot in the center. And almost like a tadpole sort of fish thing shooting out. Well, it's not a fish. It's a jet. So something's happening there because those puffy clouds on either side are actually up and down or forward and back. And notice the lower right one has a little bit of a bright spot in the center. That might be where the jet, which looks like the fish on the right, is finally slowing down or hitting some other stuff. So let's see what, what we can find out about radio galaxies. So radio galaxies emit strongly in the radio part of the spectrum. So that's what we think. So electromagnetic radiation, mostly in radio. So they're very strong radio emitters. uh, And they can have huge, huge, huge lobes of gas, which are totally invisible optically. And they go perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy, which is interesting. So you've got this, uh, this one is called Centaurus A. And Centaurus A is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky, and uh, well, on the left-hand side is the image that you that is taken uh, by uh, the upper the upper images is a is a European Southern Observatory picture image, but the one on the right was taken by by the, with the with the Parkes Observatory as well as other observatories 
to construct a very large scale image of the, of the radio emission of Centaurus A. So what I did is I took the image of, on the left and overlaid it with the image on the right to show you how big the radio lobes are compared to the image of Centaurus A. Now, what's fascinating is on the right is that the smallest structure, the littlest, tiniest lumps are about 200 light years across. So it's, you know, these are, yeah, those are big things. But yet it's pretty interesting that there is structure that's large enough to be like 200 light years across. And we see a uh, little bar at the represent that sends about 160,000 light years. So that's what the bar is worth. So this thing is huge. The extent of this thing is enormous, meaning it goes over almost a million light years across, which is big. Um, there's a lot. And because this is a radio image, the dots are not stars. Those are other active galactic nuclei, other radio sources from other massively distant galaxies that are being picked up by this particular telescope as it looks deep into the cosmos to make this incredible, incredible image. Centaurus A is the pinkish glow. That's the, the radio structure that comes from it that we do not see in visible light. And in fact, the radio energy is so incredibly large that each of the lobes is 20 million times the energy in just the radio sources as the sun puts out. And this is only happening at one wavelength. So 20 million times the energy of the sun's radius at specifically 1.4 gigahertz. So if you integrate it across all the radio emission, it's staggering amounts of energy that are being emitted. It's billions of times the mass of, of the luminosity of the sun if you integrate across all radio waves. All right, just for a very interesting contrast, uh, this is this was a fascinating way they did this. And, and uh, so the foreground telescopes are the telescopes that were taken, that were used to take the radio image uh, with the Australia Compact Array. And this is, uh, the image was done by Ileana Fain, Tim Cornwell, Ron Eakers. And then the Northern Lobe was was created with uh, by, by Morganti at Astron. And the Parks Observatory data is uh, by Jones. So the and Sh Amy Sh and Sean Amy at Cicero and CSIRO took the night sky image. So if you could see the Centaurus A in, uh, galaxy in the sky, that's where it would be, and that's what it would look like if you could see in radio emission. The radio sky is extraordinarily different than the optical sky. It would be a vastly different place. And so by comparison, we see the moon there in the sky. So a really interesting, fascinating appearance. Other famous radio galaxies, the most one of the most important ones is Cygnus A. Cygnus A is almost, a, it's like half a billion light years away. And what we see is that there's a central bright core these long jet-like structures, and then these feathery lobes at either end. And the size of this, of the object in the sky, is only one by two arc minutes. But remember, an arc minute is, the, the moon is about 30 arc minutes across. So this is only, a this would be, a, this image that you're looking at would be about the same size as one of the, one of the smaller craters on the moon, or one of the, one of the visible craters on the moon, through binoculars. So if you could see radio telescope, radio emission in the sky, you would see this extraordinarily bright source in the sky. Uh, that would be that you would eventually, with a large telescope, if your eyes could see in radio, uh, with with a, with a very large telescope. Anyway, so there's a jet-like structure which is which seems to be collimated over extraordinary distances, and at this distance, this is almost a half a million light years, or many half a million light years across. It was discovered uh, in 1939 by Grote Weber, uh, Grote Weber, and in 1951 as a bright, strong radio source. Is it actually one of the strongest? And in 1951, along with Cassiopeia A and Pupus A, were defined as radio stars, uh, as people were looking at. So people didn't know. You know, we first point radio telescopes in the sky. You just say, "What's that? Well, it's a bright point-like object. Call it a radio star." Okay, great. They were identified with, uh, with optical sources, and so they were called radio stars. Uh, Cygnus A is a radio galaxy, and the other two, Cassiopeia and Pupus A, are, are nebulae, with Cassiopeia A being that supernova run that we talked a while back about. 
Um, and in 1953, just a few years later, Jennison and Tuskupta showed it to be a double source with a radio emission. So everybody said, sort of, wow, this is neat. Let's go look at it with radio telescopes. And all radio galaxies, especially this one, have a huge, huge, huge active galaxy nucleus in the core. And there is a supermassive black hole about almost two and a half billion times the mass of the sun. And the upper, the, that's the image in red, because with radio, you have to kind of give it levels. That was taken by the Very Large Array in the NRIO, National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And on the right-hand side, what I did is I found this in the digital, the digital sky survey at Space Telescope Science Institute and made a pic and grabbed it by the 15 by 15 arc minutes to show what the region of the sky looks like in visible light. And this is the red image. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink it down and show you where it kind of appears on the sky. So that's roughly what it would look like if you could see it. It's, I don't think the orientation's right. I think I got that wrong. But the point is, is that it's kind of big. It's really bright. The galaxy itself can be seen in visible light, but the lobes cannot be seen in visible light. They can only be seen in radio. And it's one of the strongest radio sources in the sky at a half a billion light years away. Another extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily bright one is the Hercules A radio galaxy. And it was taken, the pinkish glow was taken by the very large array at three different bands. And they mixed it together to form a red, green, blue, and made some good images. And then the optical is from the Hubble Space Telescope Wide Field Camera 3 and UVES. So this thing is almost 2 billion light years away. And it's on, centered on a supermassive elliptical galaxy. Um, and there's a hugely bright galaxy in there. It's a 2.5 billion solar masses. And much bigger than the one that's in the center of the Milky Way. And what we find is that it kind of doesn't look like much in visible light, as you can see in the lower left-hand image. But it's also, but since it's the brightest radio-emitting object in the constellation Hercules, it's kind of crazy that this thing is, you know, half a billion light, two billion light years away. And it's even at that distance, it's a mil over a three, almost two million light years across from lobe, edge of lobe to edge of lobe. So something is making these jets. Something is making the jets. Something is keeping it collimated for almost a, a million light years, at least a half a million light years. And then the radio emission then gets deposited out there, and then it still glows in radio light. So the question then becomes, what exactly is making that radio emission and how does it stay in this jet-like format? And that's a big, 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 big puzzle. So there's the optical image of the visible image of, of Hercules A, and there is the Hubble, and then there is the VLA image overlaid on top of that. And this is a Hubble heritage image. Well, what exactly is it? So it's, it's supposed, because it's radio light, so it has to be very low energy radio light that there's a strong, strong, strong magnetic field. And that magnetic field is, uh, it is actually causing electrons to spiral around. And that's what an electron will do in a magnetic field. It'll, if it has any motion, it'll kind of start to go around the magnetic field lines. It'll form a curly Q. Now, if it's moving really, really fast, then what'll happen is it'll form a helix and it'll scoot around. And if it's traveling at almost the speed of light, it has a specific kind of spectrum. A single photon, a single electron, uh, will make a spectrum of light in radio light, like the hump that we see in the lower right inset, which is a single contribution from a single electron traveling at nearly the speed of light in a very strong magnetic field, or at least in any magnetic and some of the electrons are more energetic than others. And so as they travel along the magnetic field lines, each one of those electrons each emits one of those kind of humpy sort of spectra. So if you add up all the contribution from all of those individual electrons, you get what the red arrow is pointing to, which is that dashed yellow line, which kind of looks like the merging of all of those spectra. So you get what's, what's called a power law spectrum. And that power law spectrum looks completely different than, say, a black body spectrum like we saw coming from stars. There's no absorption lines in the synchrotron radiation. It's just this flat, flat, flat uh, feature. Well, we know about synchrotron radiation because of studies in, in, uh, in particle colliders as well as nuclear physics studies. So 
this has been this process is well understood and it's interesting to be found in these radio galaxies. So here's another diagram to show it and we see the electron zipping around in the magnetic field and as it goes around and around and around it emits light and as it emits light it loses energy and therefore goes a little bit slower. Now on the left hand side I kind of grabbed this other thing from Wikipedia to kind of try to show what I mean and why we think why this is a special kind of spectrum. Now if the electron is spiraling slowly meaning you know kind of fast for normal people like it'd be going faster than a person can go but if it's kind of spinning slowly, not at nearly the speed of light, the emission that an electron would make because it is accelerating, because it's going in a circle, as it goes in a circle in a magnetic field, it will emit light and it will lose energy. And that light emission pattern is shown in that kind of donuty sort of bagel thing that we see. And that's the way the light spreads out from the electron as it slowly goes around, in, if it's moving slowly and moving in electric field, or in a magnetic field. But now if you take the same magnetic field and accelerate the electron up to nearly the speed of light, you get what are called relativistic beaming effects, where all of the light gets beamed in one direction. So the direction that the, the electron is going. So that chain, that, that shape of the emission as well dictates how the spectrum will look. And that's what we see and that helps to this understanding of how it works and how the emission actually works with the light gives us an understanding of how we might get to the upper right hand sort of individual electron thing. But this is called relativistic beaming. And as the electron spins faster and faster around, it actually it goes very fast and loses just the tiniest amount of energy because it's radio light. It's got a huge amount of energy on its own, but it emits that light and gets lower and lower energy. But as they all emit in this particular way, according to this model, you get the sum of all the contributions. And that model is also borne out by looking at nuclear physics labs. So given that that's how these things kind of make their emission, let's look at some of the zoo of crazy things that we see out there. In the nearby uh, Virgo cluster, the galaxy M87, which is an enormous, enormous, supermassive giant elliptical in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, about 600,000, uh, about 60 mil 70 million light years away, roughly. And what we see is that there is these enormous, the lower left-hand image is a, an optical light image, but on the right-hand side, is a, is, a, is a radio image of the same galaxy. So this is a very strange thing that they're completely different. There's these puffy things around it. There's these weird shapes. I don't know exactly how they superimpose, but the, well, the, stru the structure on the right is much, much larger than the Milky Way. At 200,000 light years across, this thing is easily, the green puffy thing is easily twice as large as the entire Milky Way galaxy. But yet there's really bright core compact regions and then you see something that looks really jet-like that's pushing stuff out. You can almost imagine that there's this jet, jet of material being thrown out in two directions. One of them towards us and one of them away from us. Now here's a VLA study, a uh, very large array uh, by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory done by Fraser Owen and John Batia at NRAO. Um, and so we see that the VLA looking at 20 centimeter radiation shows that large jet like structure in the center. So we see the big, big, big map. Now we zoom in with the 20 centimeter VLA. We see a very tiny jet like feature. And then the right hand side is a jet and the left hand side, not so much. And then we zoom in closer and tighter with the, um, with the VLA at two centimeters. And we see that the jet has deeper resolution, it has knots and Wobbles and beads type of things, and then zoom in even tighter with seven millimeter wavelength radiation at the VLA, and we can see almost the central core. Get even tighter and tighter. We can go. We can get as tight and as small as we want, and you still get smaller and smaller radiation until you get to this amazing, amazing imagery where you now have to go to the bottom two, which are VLBI, which is very large baseline interferometry which is not just the VLA telescope, but numerous other teles radio telescopes across the United States and across the world, all combining their data together to get higher resolution of that interior structure. The VLA is only so big, so the resolution gets poorer as you zoom in. But if you, you integrate tel a bunch of radio telescopes together, with such as the VLBI, uh, then, you can, then, you get, uh, then you get much higher resolution. 
But notice as you zoom in, 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 you still maintain a compact, tiny source. So the lower left-hand image shows something that's only a quarter of a light year across. What's a quarter, like two-tenths of a light year? Two-tenths of a light year is a couple of light months, right? Or even one light month. One light month is 30 light days. 30 light days is, wow, that's a, that's pretty, that is, remember the size that the Voyager has gone is almost a light day. So the image that you're looking at across, if you look at an individual pixel, a couple of pixels across this thing is what the Voyager has traveled since it was launched in 1977. So a few pixels on this lower left-hand image is the distance Voyager has gone from Earth. So this is a really tiny, compact, extraordinarily bright object deep down in the core of M87. And the VLBA, very long baseline array, showing the inner tenth of a light year. Remember, a tenth of a light year is on that order. So we're looking at, at objects or, or resolution of a bright, compact radio source that is not that much bigger in terms of that bar. So that bar is, is one, it's like one tenth of that bar is what the Voyager has traveled since its launch. Um, this is to just try to show you the size scale that we're looking at something that can be easily measured in terms of solar system size scales. And there it is with the Hubble image showing the jet in visible, visible light. So there's something going on in radio, there's something going on there, and we described that the radio emission comes from synchrotron radiation that's coming from the spiraling of electrons in a strong magnetic field. Now you can get visible light and you can get x-ray radiation from that as well. And that's what we're seeing here in this jet coming from the center of M87. And there we see M87 using the Hubble Space Telescope done by uh, Jay Madrid at McMaster University, showing actual changes in the visible light of that bright knot in the center of the, uh, in the, center of the galaxy of M87. And just for enjoyment, to get you an idea of where the heck this thing is, the lower left is the is M87, the giant, super giant massive elliptical galaxy. It's in the Virgo cluster, and we're seeing a cluster of galaxies here. And this was taken by Chris Mijos and the colleagues at, Brunel, at the Brunel Schmidt Telescope. Uh, and this was done with the European Southern Observatory. And they took out all the foreground stars, and that's why they've got those spots of bright. Because, you know, we just want to deal with the stuff that's actually the galaxies, and not look at the stuff necessarily, and not be distracted by things that are in the foreground in the Milky Way. Another thing we can remember that with active galactic nuclei is they're really luminous, extraordinarily luminous over all wavelengths. And on the left again, we go back to our favorite, which is a Centaurus A, which is one of the most interesting, which is one of, it's a favorite target for ex active galactic nuclei studies. And on the left, we see a visible light image taken by Sarah Tololo at the IAO in Chile, uh, the Blanco 4 meter. But on the right-hand side was taken by the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope or run by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories. And so we have emission from that, from thermal emission, from at, which is we have dust and gas and thermal emission, but you would also still see dusty, gassy distortions. You know, it's extremely bright in the center. And we also see that there's some sort of jet-like structure coming above and below. So there's a, there are extreme activity in infrared, too. And if we look in ultraviolet, and this comes from the Galax mission, uh, and if there are some jets coming off of that, maybe even the jets that are coming off of that indicate star formation that's happening deep in those jets as a result of, of collisional activity. That's one possibility, but perhaps it's just a synchrotron radiation again. But this is ultraviolet light with the bluish, whitish light being higher energy ultraviolet and the yellowish light being lower energy ultraviolet. And so ultraviolet is interesting because you get these kind of circly structures, and that's because of the nature of the detector itself, not because they're bigger objects. No, we're looking at those yellow spots typically are stars in our, in our galaxy. All right, but you also see there's a density around them. So that indicates there's some activity happening around Centaurus A. Notice there's a cluster of those light yellow dots. So there's something happening as the two galaxies are colliding and making hot stars. Again, we can look at the at Centaurus A, and we see in X-ray light. This is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory from uh, from from uh, from one of their earlier studies, and we can see that the jet is formed from this uh, from uh, from the 
from various processes and x-rays. And we see the bubbles that also that are visible in radio light are also visible in x-rays. So Centaurus A has a completely different appearance in x-ray. And we see an extraordinarily luminous, hot object in the center. And the bluer the light in this image, the more energetic the x-rays we're looking at. So how do we get x-rays out of this? Well, one way is, remember that there's electrons spiraling around it, nearly the speed of light, and they're emitting radio light. What can happen is the radio light is a low energy photon. The electrons are moving really fast, and so they can collide with the photons and give some of their energy to the photon and bump it up to an X-ray. So the strong magnetic fields keep the electrons flying. Something's accelerating the electrons to nearly the speed of light and keeping them entrained inside of these, inside of these jets. And so we get X-ray emission from the radio light that they emit. So not only do they emit a radio light, they then billiard ball some of the light to get up to X-ray emission. And we call that inverse Compton scattering. So it kicks them up into high energy as they interact and gives them more energy. And that's where those jets appear. That's what most of this emission that you see comes from. So here's a series of images, a composite of radio imaging, X-ray imaging, and optical imaging from Chandra, VLA, and the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as others, to put it all together to show you what an, uh, what an active galaxy in the nearby solar neighborhood is like. We're not solar. We're talking about 14 million light years away. We've alluded to the idea that these things are bright at every wavelength, and the active galaxies are. So a normal galaxy seems to be usually a collection of stars and gas and dust. So the lower curve shows a typical normal galaxy, which would have some, a dim radio, infrared, invisible. But it's mostly an addition of a whole bunch of stars together. And we're kind of smoothing things out to make it easier to understand, but that's the basic idea. But in an active galaxy, there's enormous radio emission, there's enormous infrared emission, there's enormous visible light, and a much, much greater X-ray emission than in a normal galaxy. Normal galaxies don't tend to glow in X-rays. So the radiation from these galaxies is what we call non-stellar, meaning it doesn't come from stars. Just like I described, we have electrons zipping around, making radio light, and then they kick it up to X-rays. So this is not a thermal process that happens in stars. This is happening in magnetic fields as things are moving at nearly the speed of light. And something's actually accelerating these electrons and protons, or mostly electrons, seems to be the dominant model to actually make all this light, is, is with high-speed electrons. So something's happening deep in the galactic center to actually do that. So just to kind of really show a really high-resolution spectrum, so we go way back to one of the to Seifert's original paper, and this is by Brown and Moustakis again, and this is from uh, June of 2014, where they took a large, large, large number of data and made what's called a spectral energy dent uh, distribution, or SED. The entire spectrum of the galaxy from very, very deep in the ultraviolet all the way to very long infrared. And so the visible light wavelengths are only in between about, say, 4,000 and 0.4 and 0.7 on this graph uh, at the short end of the wavelength in microns. But then everything to the right is in infrared, and everything to the left is is ultraviolet, uh, is out into the is out of the ultraviolet. We don't go to the X rays in this particular image; that's unfortunate. But we're seeing that this is very different than most normal galaxies because of the excess brightness in infrared, as well as the enormously bright hydrogen emission lines, which you can see in emission here. Now we're going to talk about the nature of the rapid variations. See for galaxies vary really rapidly. And this is kind of a schematic diagram by which they, well, what do we mean? They got to get bright and dim by two or three or five times over the course of a few days or a couple of years. And they can actually be measured year to year, day to day, and so, month to month, and sometimes even day to day that they have their time variations. So what do we mean by that? This was a study done uh, by Aravalo et al. And they published in monthly notices in 2009. And this is an active galaxy, active galactic nucleus, the NGC 3783. And they took three different uh, sets of measurements, one in X-ray and one in Johnson B filter and Johnson V filter over a number of days. And as we can see, there are lots of variations. And this is varying. Uh, just the nucleus is varying in brightness in X-ray quite rapidly, as well as in the Johnson B, which is a visual filter, the blue end of the spectrum, and Johnson V, which is smack in the middle of the optical. 
then we actually zoom in on a very short period of time when they actually um, when they when they were able to take measurements up to three times a day, especially for the X-ray data, and they found that there's very high variability for the B and V spec uh, B and V photometry of this just the nucleus of this galaxy. So this is a relatively nearby one, or else you wouldn't be able to get B and V photometry for it of this of this quality. But you can see that the X-ray variability can vary up to a factor of two over the course of literally hours, and the fact and the and then the amount of that can come with a B and V in terms of well the, the the word flux means how much energy you're getting per second into this into your tiny little detector, meaning ergs is a measure of energy erg per second per square centimeter. So if you had a square centimeter detector, you would get this many ergs per second. And an erg is a measurement of energy, just like a joule. So it's just in CGS units rather than an SI. Okay, so we can see that there's extraordinary variability on the order of hours. Next, we find the brightest radio sources in the sky are called quasars, or quasi-stellar radio sources. And it wasn't enough to find radio galaxies, and they found extraordinary bright point-like sources of radio emission. And then when they looked at the photographs, they found there was a really fuzzy, tiny, fuzzy little star-like object that seemed to be like a star. And there's, and then when you look at the actual spectrum of a of one of these things, you find wild, broad emission lines that nobody knew really what they were at the time. And so they said, okay, it kind of looks like a star. Um, it's got a lot of radio. So it's a quasi-stellar radio source or quasar, quasi-stellar radio source. So that's where the word quasar was neologisms about. And one of the first bright ones was 3C273. It's one of the nearest uh, quasars in the sky. It's about a billion light years away. And night, so to give a little history about it, um, 1963, Martin Schmidt then looked at 3C273 and said, well, what the heck with this? He recognized that, unlike everybody else, he, uh, and there was a really huge debate about this at the time, and it took a long time for people to be convinced, is that he recognized that if you simply took the normal absorption lines in quasars or normal emission lines in quasars and simply, yeah, if, and then simply redshifted them all the way really deep, what do you get? Well, you get the, if you take normal emission lines or normal absorption lines and redshift them massively, then you get this thing that's like, oh, it fits perfectly. It's just highly redshifted. But remember, Hubble found that redshift means the greater the redshift, the more uh, the more distant it is. And so the Hubble relationship by 1963 was well established. So nobody wanted to believe at 1963 that these things were that far, because if they were that far and that bright, that meant they were insanely luminous. If they were at extraordinary distance, Martin Schmidt said, they're really luminous. And he was correct. And that is true. And so here's the typical spectrum for 3C273. And we have a lab comparison by spectrum. So let's actually kind of go through what we really mean. 3C273 has bright emission lines in hydrogen. And so this is a sample wavelength thing. And we, I, put, I overlaid the uh, optical spectrum on it. And know that we have we, the, the hydrogen alpha, which is that bright pink line that we see, that gives us the pretty pink of like the, the Orion Nebula or the Triffin Nebula or something like that. That's been pushed all the way over into the deep red at nearly 7,600 7, angstroms. And so it went from 6563 all the way to 7400. So that's a big shift. So how big a shift is it? Then we can then determine the redshift this way. We know it was observed at 760 nanometers or 7,600 angstroms. But we know that if it was hydrogen, it was emitted at 6,562 6, angstroms or 656 nanometers. So you just calculate the redshift. We said sit and, and the following way, and we find it's a redshift of 0.158, which is an enormous redshift, which implies an enormous recession velocity, which implies an enormous distance. Quasars are discovered. There's over a quarter million quasars that are really known. There are many, many, many quasars that are known, and most of them come from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this is uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey release, data release 12. And we can see this particular one has a similar redshift to 3C273 of 0.1954. And the tall right emission line is hydrogen alpha. So we have all sorts of things that are emission lines in there. 
Now, if we then go back and look at, say, let's take a quasar spectrum and put it in the rest frame and so forth like that. What the really, what's the real emission wavelength? Not what we see it to be, but what we, what it would be at emission. So we take the, we eliminate the redshift out of the picture, and what do we get? And this is called a composite quasar spectrum. It was done by Vandenberg in 2001. And what we see is that there's enormous, enormous ultraviolet emission at the Lyman alpha line. That's for hydrogen. That's the Lyman alpha. Then there's carbon, uh, ionized carbon and magnesium ionized, as well as ionized oxygen lines and hydrogen as well. It's an extraordinary emission too. So we've got this amazing, strange sort of uh, broad, broad emission lines, especially the Lyman alpha line, which is insanely broad, much broader than anything else in the sky. And it has kind of a semi-stellar sort of appearance because look at that shape. It's almost like a star, but there's something weird about that on the left-hand side. And here's this, the total wavelength spectrum across all wavelengths for 3C273. And the circles are the actual data points. And maybe there's some bars that go up and down to show you how well it's known. Um, but the, on the far right-hand side are extraordinarily energetic photons like X-rays and gamma rays. And on the far left-hand side are extraordinarily long wavelength photons like radio. But on that, there's so there's three kind of humps and there's like an additional sort of hump in the middle too. But let's actually look at the three tall humps. The one that looks kind of like in the middle, the middle hump that looks roundish, that's from thermal emission or the sum of all the stars in the galaxy surrounding 3C273. And so that's what the data points there show. On the left-hand side is emission from radio emission due to synchrotron radiation, and that's the long wavelength stuff. On the right-hand side is X-ray and gamma ray emission that comes from that comes from the inverse Compton scattering process that I described before. And so there's an enormous jet. There's three separate processes that give dominant radiation. So the idea that this kind of models the spectrum really well, actually when you combine it together. And the top line is just kind of the best fit overlay on top of the three underneath curves. And the other one down below is another contribution, which I forget exactly what it does. I think that might be dust emission. It's probably more like dust emission because of it kind of kind of goes up and then drops off rather rapidly. Therefore, quasars are the most luminous objects in the universe. They can have up to something that's a hundred, that's a hundred, a hundred trillion times the luminosity of the sun. 100 trillion times the luminosity of the sun. Not a billion, but 100 trillion. Remember, the luminosity of the, sun, of the Milky Way is about 10 to, is about 100 billion, or 10, uh, 10 to 9, 10 to 10, 10 to the 11th solar luminosities. So this one object can have a thousand times the luminosity of the entire Milky Way, and most of the light from this is coming from the center of the object. This is 3273, it's still pretty near, but its luminosity as a point-like object all comes from the central region, just like we saw in M87's study of the VLA. If we then look at other quasars, they, they actually thought that they were galaxies for a while and couldn't resolve them, so it took a long time for people to actually resolve the surrounding galaxy because quasars are pretty freaking bright. So they're extraordinarily bright objects. And finally, this one was an image that was released in 1994 using the Hubble Space Telescope. There were other, there were other images that showed some pretty good observations uh, from ground-based things that were extraordinarily good studies of this exact thing. But then the Hubble Space Telescope confirmed what looks like a bar-like structure in the center of it all, surrounded by what looked like a spiral arms. So we have that there's a host galaxy with an extraordinarily bright object in the center. And this must be a colliding galaxy. And the, the, something what's happening is, is that the bright, the quasar object is the bright central core. Quasars also have radio lobes. And this is another one. This is a quasar 3C175 taken with the VLA at six centimeters, 1996. Um, and I provide the link there so you can go hunt it down. And yeah, you can see that quasars themselves, in addition to being bright, bright, bright luminous sources, are also staggeringly luminous radio sources as well. So to kind of sum it up, we, we discussed in a previous lecture the luminosity of galaxies, and we found that irregulars are kind of the little bitty guys, and then elliptic, and then spirals are lots of places where star factories are being done, and they're more massive, 
So they're more massive, they have more, uh, more gas and dust, so they can be more luminous. However, ellipticals tend to be the collision train wrecks where things kind of mash together and they can be little tiny things or super massive uh, ellipticals like M87. But quasars top them all. They are the most luminous objects in the universe and, and they can be up to uh, 10 to the 14th times the luminosity of the sun, which is a thousand times more luminous than the Milky Way. It's as though the a thousand Milky Way galaxies are compressed inside an area that we'll find inside a volume that's smaller than the solar system. So this is really catastrophically bizarre that something a thousand times more luminous than the entire Milky Way seems to be coming from a little volume that could fit inside the solar system. Just in rough schematics, normal galaxies just have gas and dust and they got a nucleus and such forth. And, you know, it's kind of pretty and such forth. But then we look at this edge on views, of course. If it's got an active galactic nucleus, then the center is really, really bright. And it's got bright, broad emission lines. It's probably formed by something like we call a supermassive black hole, which we'll justify next time. But a quasar is so insanely bright, it drowns out that thing. It's not that, that, that the disk doesn't is, exist. It's that it's the contrast is so great that you can't see the disk. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's that it's too bright to see it. So it's like, hey, hey, stare at this light. Uh, stare at my flashlight. Oh, I can't stare at your flashlight. It's too bright. That's exactly the point. You can't see the stuff on the flashlight. So this is the kinds of activity comparisons that we see between galaxies. So we're going to look next time at exactly what drives these galaxies, what makes this active galactic nucleus. And that's a really fascinating study that we alluded to with the, uh, many lectures ago. We talked about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now we're going to see that effect in full focus next time when we talk about the central engines of supermassive black holes. See you soon.